Hi, everybody, and welcome to Writing Guys podcast. So glad to see you guys every again this week. Today, we have Michael Aspen and C.T. Andrews, our lovely hosts, who are going to answer a very tricky question. So the question this week is, what would women be surprised to know about men? And since last time we picked on Michael, this time we're going to pick on C.T. Oh, man. No, go pick on Michael. Well, ah. I'm not a mind reader either, man. I don't know what women are thinking. What the... <laughs> you, need to... <laughs> you need to ask Patricia what she's thinking so we know what to think about what she's thinking so we can answer what we think about that. <laughs> so it's not. <laughs> what do you think men would be surprised to know when they think about women? Yeah, something like that. We want to know what you think we think we should be telling you about what we think you think. <laughs> oh well what i think what i think you think you should be thinking about i'm thinking about is is actually what you're thinking about that is crystal clear exactly <laughs> yes <laughs> all right so i'll answer the question to the best of my ability and um so what is the question what would women <laughs> It escaped me. Um, That's escaped me too, man. Let's let's read it again. What's the question again, Patricia? What would women be surprised to know about men? Okay. Oh, man. oh. what? what women? I can throw a joke answer out there. This is the same joke answer we told in the last episode. Men don't compare penis sizes. <laughs> it's just man. never done. Don't do that. Don't do that. Does that surprise you, Patricia? <laughs> no, no, not really. Damn it. I was hoping I'd get one right out of the gate. Yeah, I know. How, how, how good would that have been? Um, okay, so here's here's one. Um, you know, it's it's very uh, it's it's very common that when a guy approaches a woman, whether it be at a grocery store or whatever. And okay, how do I how do I put this? His objective, his entire objective is to see if you, the woman, accepts or rejects his advances. Um, so when a woman goes, oh, he's a he's a jerk, he's just a jerk, he's creepy. He doesn't give a damn if that's what you think. He doesn't care because his his question is answered. Um, he that's what he approached you to find out are you going to accept him or are you not and if you're not because you call him I mean I say you because a woman calls him creepy or has all these uh derogatory words the reality is what choice did he have <laughs> he had the only other option was not to approach the girl so that's a risk that he is willing to take so when women think they're being uh inflammatory by calling him a creep he didn't care he doesn't care if you think he's a creep. He doesn't care because he had to find out. And I don't know if that surprises women, but I bet it does. And the reason I think it does is because why else would they walk around going, he's such a creep. He's a creep. He's a creep. He's a creep. That guy's a creep. <laughs> he knows. He doesn't care. Because the alternative would be, or the other possibility is that, that the woman actually finds him playful and energetic and likable and attracted to him one or the other I, so i don't know if i i don't know if i should revoke my man card because i care very much if somebody thinks i'm a creep <laughs> that bothers me a lot um i got a serious one i got kind of a serious one um being a man is really lonely it's it's really lonely um there are a whole lot of things that you cannot talk about to anybody. There's just nobody there to talk to about. There, there's a lot of topics that you can't talk about. Emer emotional pain, nobody, nobody wants to hear it. Um, if you're dealing with, if you're worried about your job or you're worried about your future, or you're worried about money, um, very few people want to hear you talk about it. Even your wife sometimes doesn't want to hear these things, right? You, you hear a lot of comments like, you know, man up or suck it up or just deal with it um there's nobody that you can talk to uh, on a lot of topics um if you get a really good bro a really good friend you might be able to talk to them 
But even then, sometimes, you, I mean, you got to be careful because sometimes their answer is going to be, suck it up, bro. You know, you got to, there are, there are relationships that come across your life periodically that are really close like that. Or maybe you have one that's a really good long-term friend that you can talk to about stuff like that. But a lot of men, myself included, I'm going to be honest right now, put a little bit out there. There's a lot of topics I have nobody to talk to. Can't talk to my wife about it because she may be part of the problem. And I got nobody else. There is nobody else to talk to. So uh, there's a lot of times where you're just sort of suffering in silence with some of that stuff. Um, and the reality is, is that women often exclaim that they wish men were more vulnerable and talked about that stuff, but then we get shut down as soon as we do. So we don't. So that's yeah. one. I'd say yeah. that's probably one. There's, well, a couple of things to say about that. You, you know, this is what conversation is. I hear you talk and like, oh, yeah, I want to I want to hit on that point. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I feel like I suffer in silence a hell of a lot. Mm. But I don't I don't attribute that to being a man. I attribute that to being other things, um, a writer um, or single or. Uh, a lot of these things that uh, causes me to suffer in silence, um, I don't think are attributed to being a man specifically, rather than just the, the position that I hold in life, in this world that I'm constantly trying to navigate. The, the interesting thing is, if I did complain, or if I did suffer loudly, let's say, because I'm a, about being a writer or about being single, how would the world then look at me specifically because I'm a man? Is he just a, you know, he's complaining about being a writer, but he's a man and he needs to toughen up and shut up and just whatever, whatever, whatever. Or he's complaining about being single. Uh, so he needs to, he's a man, he needs to go out there and, and hang himself out there to dry, or so to speak, or take those chances or take those risks where I think the response might be a little bit different if it's a woman who decided to not suffer in silence anymore. Yeah. That's just a theory, a possibility. I'm putting it on the table for, for consideration. I don't know, but it is true that more men are mentally ill because of the you know because societal the, constrictions uh say that again the societal constrictions societal okay yes maybe that's what i'm trying to say and having a great deal of difficulty at least i'm not being silent um societal constrictions i think cause a great deal more mental health for men than women when it comes to being a failure when it comes to uh not providing when it comes to you know losing your your job or or whatever you know depression and anxiety i mean i know a lot of women that suffer from these things too i'm just so maybe that's not entirely true but i think being a man has specifically does play into that for a lot of guys so do you think that the expectations of men to, you know, suck it up and just kind of be silent, do you think that that, you know, that puts pressure on to a point where there, there is no more hiding behind it, you know, um, where it, it kind of erupts, whether it's in, in outward violence or inward violence or, you know, a situation where you're you know whether you're subconsciously looking for it or not you're you're kind of putting yourself into a position of risk does that make sense yes it makes sense and the answer is yes yeah. i i think you know um extreme case here when's the last time you heard of a woman shooting up a school or uh a grocery store or even even some political statement like uh, uh an abortion clinic these are all men doing this kind of thing because uh, because of that very reason at least partially yeah you you find yourself wanting to drive uh you drive anger and frustration and 
the desire for physical pain back on yourself too. I know like in, in my world, there are certain topics that I feel like I don't have anybody to talk about it with. And when I do bring them up to my wife, she oftentimes will just shut down and just not respond at all. And it just makes me feel like I'm in a situation where I'm like, nobody wants to hear you, Sean. Nobody gives a shit about what you think. Nobody wants to understand your pain. You're just a worthless piece of crap. Why do you even try? Right. And you just sort of sit and say to yourself, just shut up. Just shut up. Nobody cares. Shut up. And that mental voice is there often. And I wouldn't say like every day or every week even, but I mean, often enough that it's a, it's somebody I know that person is that person speaking in my head is somebody that I know. And I recognize that voice because it's there often enough. I'm like, Oh yeah. Hey, yeah, you're back. Yeah, you're right. I'm going to shut up now. Right. And, and that that's it. You just, nobody wants to hear it. So talking about it breeds both violent reactions within yourself, makes you angry at yourself but also you get angry at other people because no, you, you really do feel like nobody cares. Nobody wants to hear that. So you just stop. You just, you know what? I'll just hold it in. I'll hold it in as best I can. And uh, it'll bubble over at some point maybe, but hopefully you just end up you know, like punching yourself in the stomach instead of, <laughs> instead of going and getting a rifle, right? So, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, it's hard. That, that, that loneliness is hard. I don't want to make this a depressing episode. We can move on to something else, but it, it is hard. I, I, I think, I think this, is, this is actually a really good conversation. Um, so, you know, I, I know that there are, that there are, are, are things, you know, society has said, well, you know, you, men don't cry. They don't do this. They don't do that. They don't whine about their little problems because that's PMSing and blah, blah, blah. Um, do you do you feel that there is the opportunity to seek um, assistance or to seek help to help alleviate that pressure when it gets to be too much? I think so. I mean, and I know what you're getting at, and that it's the idea that there's more help for women out there than men. Um, um, but that, that isn't those, that help that you see that, that is out there for women is addressing very large sweeping cultural issues like, um, women being battered or rape victims or things like that. But when it comes, when you hone all of that down to the individual, I mean, sure. I think I think there's psychological help out there for men. I think that there's, you know, uh, they they have to go seek it. But um, anyone would have to go seek it. No one's going to come ask you. Hey, you want a psychologist? <laughs> you have to go ask people. Are you a psychologist? Because I think I could use one. Uh, you know. So I, I don't know. I, I think the help is out there. Um, but I'm not a. Uh, what are those professionals that uh, study and analyze societies? What are they called? Anthropologists. Anthropologists? Oh. No, sociologists. Sociologists. So, yeah, I'm not a sociologist. I don't know all the numbers. I have no idea. But uh, I mean, I would like to think there's help out there for men who suffer from anxiety, depression, things like that. I've so, seen you shaking your head, Michael. You disagree. Yeah, I, I disagree. Um, so there is a tremendous amount of help available to women that is not institutional. It's not some person you go and pay. Um, there are psychiatrists or psychologists, whichever you would prefer, that are available for a fee to everybody. But that's like the one of the only avenues available to men. Women have girlfriends they can talk to. They have other men they can talk to. They have friends they can talk to. Even sometimes parents. Right. Uh, I remember my mom one time telling me just to suck it up. And so I my avenue for talking to people is pretty limited. It's, it's very small. So when you when you talk about do you have resources available, they're few and far between. And more importantly, they probably cost money. 
which I don't always have available to provide for that. And, and that kind of thing isn't cheap, right? I remember being super excited. I used to work for a, a company you've probably heard of um, that has a card in their name and they're the master of that. So they had a, a pretty extensive uh, package for like um, benefits. And one of them was psychological help. You could talk to a psychologist and, but it was limited to 20 sessions a year. So 20 sessions a year isn't even once a week. So that's barely once a month. It's like a month and a half, like, like uh, one and a half times a month on average. So that's not really enough to, to address bigger concerns that you may have, right? Bigger problems. It's enough probably for like smaller things, but I don't know. I've never been through therapy. I don't really know, don't know how long it takes, but I've, I've talked to people who have been in therapy and they've said it really helps. But again, therapy is kind of like dating from what they tell me. You have to go and find the right therapist because the wrong therapist will just make things worse. Yes. So, um, but even still, <laughs> Who, who has the financial resources to go paying for that on a regular basis? Not a lot of people. So, so do you think, um, do you think that that is a roadblock to seeking that assistance? What money? Yeah, money. Sure. Um, I, I'm coming from, I'm coming from, from a world where we don't have to pay for those things. I mean, if, if the doctor says we need to see one, we get a referral and off we go to the, 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 the psychiatrist's office and we sit down and we have our counseling sessions and away we go. Um, <laughs> so I'm wondering if that is, is a, a component to exasperating the situation. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Money, money that, so especially if you're in a marriage scenario where it's not your money, it's our money. Um, you would have to both decide that that is a priority enough to spend money on. So you'd have to take money away from something. This is, we're not, we're not poor, right? We're lower middle class, somewhere in there, maybe middle class, middle, middle class. So it's not like we don't have money, um, but we would have, even in our situation, we'd have to divert money from something else. Are we going to divert it from paying for a vacation or paying for the new windows or paying for the new furniture or, you know, are you really, are you going to be so selfish? You're going to give that up. This is my voice in my head. Are you going to be so selfish? You're going to give that up just so that you can go to therapy for a year and not even solve your problem. That's kind of the mantra that goes through your head, right? So money is a big part of it. And then the social stigma, there's a stigma. Uh, here where I live, there is, I don't know if that's everywhere, but here there's a stigma associated with going to see a therapist. It's typically not something that you would advertise to just people in general. Um, it's something that you would have to, you would have to do on the, on the down low. I, I, I think mental health as a whole, there's a huge stigma attached sure. to it. Yeah. Um, and I think that's one of the huge reasons why we have such a huge problem with mental health because there is such a stigma. Um, it's not considered so. real. That there's a lot of people that think that if you, it, you know, just, if you would just focus and if you would just, you know, uh, be more disciplined, you could make it go away. Uh, uh -huh. And I don't know that that's always the case. I, I know that it's not for me. There's I, uh, discipline and keeping certain things out of my life does help a lot. It's never gone. No. No, it really isn't. <clears throat> CT, do you have anything to add to that? Um, no, I don't suppose I do. Um, I, if I had to look at myself objectively, which is impossible to do, yeah, I would say that I don't really, I don't ever experience a whole lot of those issues. Um, I say that I suffer in silence a lot because I do, but again, I don't think that makes me unique. I think a lot of people do, most people, if not all people for one, uh, to one degree or another, suffer in, in, in a little bit of silence. But I was, I was raised by two fantastic parents. A, a, a person could not ask for better parents. And from that, I got a great deal of perspective. I keep a healthy perspective on the world and the people around me. 
And uh, that, that I think sees me through a lot, a lot, you know. Huh? So I'm lucky, I'm fortunate. I'm a little envious of that. I'll be honest with you, I am. But I didn't want to make this the mental health hour. Uh, <laughs> seriously, we can change topics. I'd love to talk about other things that women want to know, what men think that they want to know. So, All right. Um, are there... Are there other are there other things that you're like yeah I'd like to that you can think of or should we just go ahead and start picking other ones at random? One. Oh, go. Let's. let's, let's CT. CT has one. Go. Go. CT's CT. got one. Yeah. So I have a philosophy. I can't speak for any other man on planet Earth when it comes to this, but I can certainly speak for myself. And I'm very proud of the fact that I. I'm not proud of it. I love the fact that of the two genders, men and women, or the two sexes, male and female, I am the sacrificial one. There's something about that that I just really, really love. For instance, oh. yeah, for, for instance, if you, if you, if, if a disease came tomorrow and wiped out nine out of 10 men, nine out of 10 men all died tomorrow there'd be a lot of paperwork <laughs> but the the human species would still be able to propagate at about the same same degree that they do now a lot of happy guys you know and, but but, but oh, we, we'd still be able to move forward but if you if you take um 90 percent of women and a disease came tomorrow and killed 90% of women. I mean, even just saying the words, the mood of the entire conversation changes. We're screwed. We are done as a species. It's going to take us a thousand years to get back to where we are today, which suggests to me that biology has a favorite. And that favorite is women. And therefore, men are the biologically uh, expendable gender. And with that comes so many responsibilities that I, that I as a man, have to be responsible for. And I, I love that fact. I'm happy about that. I, do, I don't want to be the other one. I want to be this one. Okay, and so, all right, I got, I got a counterpoint there. I got my own version of that statement. So number one, CT can keep, he can be one of the nine. I'll be the 10th one. Cause I have no, I don't like being the expendable gender. I really don't. But I will tell you that uh, in my youth, I'm in my late forties now, but in my youth, boy, a lot of those more uh, dangerous type careers were much more appealing, right? Um, so I, I do think there's like a genetic encoding of that, but I, so I'm going to jump and I'm just going to, I'm going to throw one other quick one out there for myself. And that is, I don't know if women know how, how damn appealing their physical appearance is. And I'm not just talking about like makeup and, and their face and stuff. I mean, just the shape of a woman is, I don't, I don't know how, how to explain that to you, that it is like a fucking drug. It is just so, I mean, you know, you get mad at us for looking at other women. I'm like, you don't understand. I'm a crack addict and there is literally crack walking by all the time and I can't not look. It is, <laughs> is, it is just insane how deeply ingrained that is inside our brain that you look at a woman and you're just like, whoa, whoa the, the legs, the ass, the breasts, the tummy, the shoulders, I mean, everything fingers the eyes everything the, yeah the hair the neck the way they when they wear their hair up in the nape of the oh for fuck's sake man you just yeah. don't even know i don't think how maybe you do maybe there are women in the audience going oh yeah, we know we know, we know. We know. But I think there are some women that don't get it right i i know my wife is one of them she's like don't look at me i'm ugly i'm like Listen, listen, Michael, if they understood what it did, then they would not do what they do. Oh, they still do what they do. So it's like, OK, you're doing that. It's, you must not understand what you're doing. <laughs> oh, my gosh. It's torture. 
it's it's well it's not torture it's very enjoyable <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's very enjoyable but there's so many times i've watched a girl walk through applebee's or whatever and i literally turn to my friends i'm like and i said oh that's a 30 minute get over right there it's going to take me 30 minutes to come down from just watching this particular girl walk through the door i'm yeah and it's yeah it it there's yeah. a thing there's a thing about it that's uh and there, there are some that are longer than that there are some that are longer than 30 minutes i yeah. i tell you a story this is this is going to sound horrible but i i was a friend of mine one time i don't go garage sailing i i just garage sailing to me is just a really great way to spend a whole lot less money on crap that you're going to put in your own garage sale so what i end up doing what i end up doing is this guy said oh if you know how to go garage selling you find fantastic deals so he took me out to show me what it was like and his wife is from it's not thailand but she's she's from the she's from the far east i don't remember exactly which country uh, off the top of my head uh, but i'm just gonna say thailand for now because that's an easy one just to throw out there um and, and my aunt is from thailand so we'll just prop that up a little bit so anyway uh we went to go visit his wife's friend and their daughter was there uh, the wife's friend's daughter was there running the garage sale and i swear to god supermodel good looking i mean like just she was tall she was thin she was pretty she was tan all the time and she even in the winter time it was like it was it was like october and she still looked like she had been out on a beach all day right and she was she had that smile that you're just it makes it, she was so attractive she makes it where your brain just goes puts the brakes on and you just can't think of anything to say you're like uh, yeah 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 and you're done you're done. Somebody grabs you by the arm, walks you away. And then a couple of minutes later, you're like, yeah, hi, I'm Sean. And your whole, like everything catches back up. And that's a lifetime get over. I will never forget her. Even though I never even, I literally did that. I just like, I couldn't think of anything to say because she just, she just struck me that hard. Yes. And and, but that's, that's a lifetime get over. I will, I will occasionally think of her for the rest of my life, just because, and I saw her maybe five minutes, maybe five minutes. Yeah, never saw her again, never talked to her, never had a conversation about her. Don't even remember her name. It, but that's there. I've met other people like that. And not always there was it a physical attraction. Sometimes it was also a personality and physical, like you found them physically attractive. And then you started talking to them and you're like, oh, wow, you're awesome. I'm going to remember you for the rest of my life. And then, yeah, there's other ones that are like CT said, that's a 30 minute get over or an hour or a day. Yeah. Well, you know, 30 minutes to come down from the moment, but, but, yeah. you know, you're absolutely right. And the proof is the fact that you still remember it. Like when I said Applebee's earlier, I wasn't being random there. I was at an Applebee's one time and a girl walked in with two of her friends and it was like nothing else existed, but her. And, yeah. and I was just like, Oh my God. There was another time I was dating a girl and she, she made, she took the risk, the chance, fortunately it paid off for her of taking me over to one of her friend's apartments where they were having a 4th of July thing. I'd never met her friend. I didn't know who she was. I got introduced to her floored, floored. And that was very, very difficult for me because for the rest of that relationship, every time that girl was around, I had to, really really just like excuse myself or <laughs> wear the blinders yes put the blinders on yeah it's a real yeah. thing that happens there and there are um, times there are times i think when women think the guy is being awkward or weird when in reality what he's doing is he's trying not to look at you because it will stick with him and he's like you know looking down or looking over the side or whatever and not interacting with you he's not being awkward or weird he's literally just like if i look at you I got to spend the next three days trying to get you out of my head. And I don't have that kind of mental energy. I got shit to do. Right. So <laughs> I can't do that. Anyway, I forgot to start the timer, by the way, because I'm an idiot. So I went through all that effort and I don't know how long we've been on here. So hopefully, hopefully this is a good one. Yeah, we're at 29. You, had a question, you had a question, Patricia. I'd love to hear it if you yeah, want to ask it. 
Well, you know, okay, this is going to sound really, really weird. You guys talk about, okay, well, that you can't look at a woman because you might remember or whatever. Um, so how do, how would a woman differentiate between a guy who's being awkward and can't look at you because, you know, you're going to be burned into their brain and a guy who's trying not to look at you because he has nefarious purposes in mind? What's the difference? How do you tell the difference? I don't, I don't know that you would know that if you didn't know the person already exactly. right? or have somebody to vouch for them. Yeah. There's, yeah. I don't know that there's any outward symbol that would give that away. Yeah. Yeah. That's, you got to know the person, the guy specifically mm -hmm. or individually. Or, uh, but you, or the yeah. people that you're hanging out with. Right. If, if the people are hanging out with are cool and the person that came is like married to somebody it's a good bet that that person is probably just trying not to, not to ugly, not to just go like this. Right. And so, um, but, uh, yeah, I think, I think also if they, if the person's initiating something, so if you're, I would say a really good indicator is if the guy's constantly showing up where he shouldn't, right. If I'm showing up cause my wife is there and, and I see you and I'm trying to not look at you and, and all that kind of stuff. And then I leave with her and you don't see me like at work or at the grocery store or wherever, then it's a good chance that that's what's going on. But as soon as he starts popping up at places where he wouldn't normally be, that's a good bet that he's doing something else, right? He's either trying to work up the courage to talk to you or more nefarious things. Yeah. And the truth, is, I can think of. the truth is, um, I think, all guys are guilty of the lockjaw, the, you know, yeah. stare. Um, but for the most part, though, we're all guilty of it. I think for the most part, we are uh, hopefully, at least once we get to a certain maturity level, a little more in control of it than that. Oh, and yeah. So, so if, if, uh, if you're, if a woman is in the position that you just painted, Patricia, um, hopefully the guy is mature enough to strike up a conversation with her to talk to her to to you know um or go uh, strike up a conversation with somebody else so it's not obvious that he's trying to avoid her there's other yeah, avenues too yeah that happens too. yeah yeah that happens too yeah yeah and, uh, um uh so i i think if they're yeah it's it's hard to say i mean if someone had nefarious objectives they would probably hide the fact that they have nefarious objectives thereby making it very difficult to identify yeah so yeah i mean you can't you, you just gotta you know use your woman's sense i suppose listen to the gut the gut never leads you wrong there you go that's right <laughs> better say than sorry <laughs> yes you look so damn good and you won't have to worry about all that <laughs> And it, well, and you know, so there's a there's a line of thought, and it's it's propagated by a lot of people online, that says that women are responsible for the attention that they get by the way that they dress, and um, the the attitude or the argument that really made me understand how stupid that argument is, is the argument that says the guy got hit over the head with a baseball bat because he wasn't wearing a helmet. I mean, he obviously wasn't wearing a helmet, so why wouldn't he want to get hit in the head with a baseball bat? And the reality is, is that um, it's, it's a fine line every guy has to walk between trying to, if, you, if, you're, if you're on the market, I'm not on the market, so I can't, I can't do this part of it. But if I'm on the market, if I was dating or trying to date, there's a fine line of, I find you attractive and I would like to engage you and I find you attractive and I'm going to stalk you, right? There's it because... The, re the woman's reaction to the guy defines the category of the behavior the guy is exhibiting, right? If a guy that she's interested comes up and gives her a flower at a gas station, oh my God, that's so sweet. If a guy that she doesn't want to have in her life comes up and gives her a flower at the gas station, oh my God, he's such a creeper. So it's, it's always, you're, you're always trying to read what can be fabulously confusing social cues to try and figure out am i a creeper or am i somebody she's interested in because a lot of times the reaction that we get is oh that's so sweet thank you so much 
That could be, oh, I really like you. That was really sweet. Or I'm saying this to get you to leave me alone. Go away. <laughs> and so it's it, it's difficult for us to know what how to how to handle that. So um, but the reality is, is that women have the right to be left alone if they want to be. And and it's difficult to know when that is. I wish there was like a universal symbol that women could have, right? Like I have this feather I'm going to put in my hair, hair behind my ear. And this means go away. I don't want any guy to talk to me, period. And I want to be left alone. I don't care how hot I look. Don't talk to me. Um, but there isn't. So, you know, we just have to rely on those fabulously confusing social cues. Yeah. And they are fabulously confusing, aren't they? Um, yeah. Well, and two, I think, I think two women approach it differently. And I think this is this is a perfect topic for another podcast, honestly, because it it delves into a whole different ball game. But I I think it, I think I did there, down. Don't lose it. I, I did. I did. Yeah. <laughs> I think when when you compare how women perceive a situation compared to how they don't. Now, there is um, we have such. A, a rape culture and I mean it's not a new thing I mean it's been around for for decades and decades and decades and we we do the 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 victim blaming and we do the the victim shaming and I when I say we have a rape culture I don't necessarily mean just strictly women I'm talking about men as well because men are just as many that are just as likely to be victims of sexual assault as a woman um there's just a different way it's handled which is doesn't make any sense to me, but whatever. Um, That's a deep topic. It's a very deep topic, which we're not going to get into. <laughs> um, so I, I think there's that perception. Now, I, I read um, recently, I read this this post, and I don't know how true it was, about, about a nurse who gets called to the school because her daughter has punched this, this kid in the face and made his nose bleed because he was snapping her bra strap, and he actually snapped it, and it came undone so she walks into the school and the, the the principal's like well your your daughter assaulted this kid and she turns to her daughter and she says explain to me what happened well he kept snapping and I told him to leave me alone I told the teacher nobody did anything so when my bra strap snapped I turned around and I punched him and the principal's like we can't condone that that you know blah 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 and the the mother said to the principal oh so you called me down here to see if I'm going to press sex charges of sexual assault against the other against the male student, and the reaction in the room was just absolute horror. Like the the boy's mother is crying, and the father looks furious, and the principal's look you know looking like a guppy fish, and um, oh no no we don't want to go, but it's 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 become such a universal issue that I don't think you know. I don't think women quite are as comfortable with the the man not looking at them or you know trying to ignore them because it's so ingrained in us that we need to be on high alert because we don't know like if if I you know I'm at a party and I don't know you I don't know your wife I'm just there with some other other people I have no idea what your intentions are. So therefore I'm going to be on red alert the minute I notice you kind of eyeing me out the side of your eye, you know? So I think that that also plays into it, whether that's your intention or not is, 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 you know, it is irrelevant in the situation, because like I said, I may not know you. And if I don't know you, I don't know what your intentions are. So I'm going to be on high alert. Right. Yeah. Well, that's, we're back to the fantastically uh, confusing social cues. Yeah. Right. I, I am, I'm a crack addict and there's a piece of crack in the room that I, that my eyes, it's eye candy. It's, yeah. it's a terrible term, but that's really what it is. It is something that my eyes are continuously drawn to, right? Out of the corner of my eye, I'll see a female that's attractive and I'm like, oh, oh yeah, I shouldn't do that. Oh, oh I shouldn't do that. Oh, oh, I shouldn't do that. Right. And um, so, so the guy is trying to a respect well some guys in my case i'm trying to respect you by not just openly staring at you but at the same time i keep getting drawn back to looking at you so for me that cue is i'm doing my best but it's a struggle because you're really attractive but to the woman that's here's a shifty guy that's ogling me on the sly right yeah. and like i said it that 
that could be very different if she like if she finds me attractive and she sees that that might be disarmingly cute oh he's so bashful right it it varies a lot based on what the guy's intentions are but it also varies a lot on your impression of what the what the person's intentions are and now, now, now we're, we're right back to the very first point I made in this podcast. <laughs> good, the, good, good. And the girl goes, well, he's a creeper. He doesn't care if you think he's a creeper. He had to find out one way or the other if you're going to accept him or not. And so, and so it's funny how we've just circled right back around in a loose sort of way. Oh, but you're, yeah, you're right. We did. Yeah. yeah we but, absolutely but, did. Like, yeah, I mean... And we keep saying whether we don't we don't know what his intentions are, um, as if that's unique. No one ever knows what anybody's intentions are, you yeah. know. And and from that we get all of these. Uh, what, what are they? Fantastically confusing, confusing so social systems or whatever, yeah. whatever it is. And it's just it's it's the game that we play, and we either choose to like it or we choose not to like it. And that's where I come from um and because you know we're we, yeah we, that, that i think we i think we're getting ready to start down yet another podcast episode on another topic which is the game right no i'm serious because i have so many different thoughts on that than you do ct i'd love to talk about that yeah yeah it, it would be fun i think there would be actually some actual dissension amongst cool. the voices in I the podcast. So. yeah <laughs> on that one especially yeah <laughs> Did you write I that down so. too, Patricia, about the game? I uh, can write it down if you didn't. Me, just, yeah, yeah. Or you write it down because I was just, I was just adding a different one in there. Okay. So, so I'm gonna uh, put down. So I'm gonna put down the game and how do men react to it? Uh, I'm gonna put the dating game, dating slash relationship game. All right. That, cool. that makes sense. That makes perfect sense. All right. All righty. So I think we're at uh, we're at our time for this evening. Thank you, everybody, for for joining us uh, for this uh, rather deep conversation this time. It was a roller coaster you. this time. It was. It was. But that's what we're here for. So. Um, Thanks again to Michael and to CT for, for joining us and, uh, answering the questions. Um, thank you to everyone that stopped in. Please hit the subscribe, like, share button. Um, and don't forget to stop by the website, writingguys.net, and uh, drop in a question for us to add to the list for the show. And we will see everybody next week. Have a great evening, everybody. Bye. Bye.